To another episode of Keep It Fictional from the Port Moody Public Library, I am once again joined by my book friends Sadie, Mark, Corinne, and Fiona, and we are here um, for part two of our most anticipated episode. So last week we told you about fifteen books that we are dying to read, and now we have another ten for you. So um, let's start. Today, um, we are going to start with Fiona. Excellent. Thank you, Virginia. I have a book about cowboys and vampires. I am so excited. <laughs> so um, I am going to talk about Isabel Cana's uh, new book. So um, she is the author of The Hacienda, which has been on my TBR since it came out, uh, but I haven't had a chance to read it yet. Heard good things, uh, but now... I think I'll probably start this with this one, Vampires of El Norte. Um, so this is set in 1840s Mexico. Um, and uh, it is about a young woman living in a village where there is tension with the Anglo settlers. But there's something even more sinister than that tension. Um, something unnamed is out there. Uh, nine years ago, this woman, Nina, was attacked by one of those things. And her sweetheart, Nestor, fled, believing her to be dead. Um, he becomes a vaquero, uh, which is like a cowboy. And she goes off on a life and becomes a healer. This story is about um, when they meet again and they have to, I think, both confront uh, the past of, of leaving and also confront that sinister something that definitely is vampires. <laughs> I mean, it's right there in the title. So, um I am so excited about this one. Uh, yeah, because like I said, I've heard really good things about the Hacienda and just sort of um, I'm very into the gothic horror that is coming out right now. Um, the 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 mood of it. And then um, I I like vampires. I don't think I like to admit it, um, but I think if you're going to take them in an interesting direction and especially if you're going to put them with cowboys it's like the perfect mood um so i am very very excited uh for this one vampires of el norte all right Ooh, i get to pick who goes next hmm all right uh let's take it to sadie all right uh so my fourth book that i'm going to be talking about is a debut novel um and it is by emma Taurus, I believe. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, and this goes back to, I, I feel like, okay, all of the books I've talked about today are very classic Sadie books. Um, but this is once again, a classic Sadie book. And it kind of follows a similar theme to the first book I talked about uh, last week uh, about magical books. And who would not like a magical book? Um, so this book is called Ink, Blood, Sister, Scribe. And it's by Emma Tortz. And uh, this book follows two sisters, Esther and Joanna Calate, and um, they live very, very different lives. Uh, Joanna lives um, at home with her father, and she shares her father's magical ability um, to sense magic in books. Um, and both of these sisters know about kind of this big secret that that goes on in the world. Um, and the, the big secret is that magic is real. Uh, magic exists. Magic is real. Not many people know that. Um, and magic is channeled through these enchanted books. And so um, Esther and Joanna's father, uh, he has a collection of these books and he's devoted his life to these books and to magic. Um, and he spent all of his life studying them, but he still hasn't been able to figure out how these magic books were written, where the magic came from and how they were written. Um, and so one day he's trying to figure this out and he does a spell from one of the books and it unfortunately kills him 
Joanna, sharing the, the same ability that her father did, um, steps into his role and takes over this enchanted library. Now, Esther has a different life laid ahead for her. Uh, before her father died, he told Esther that uh, she is immune to all magic. And because of that, she will always be on the run from people trying to hunt her. And from this, uh, the people trying to hunt her are the same people that killed their mother years ago. And so Esther is never able to stay in one place for long. Um, she is always having to leave. Her father gave her the date of November 2nd. She can never stay anywhere beyond November 2nd. The one time that she tested that theory, her father was right. There is somebody who appeared who tried to kill her and she was forced to flee. Uh, so Esther has now settled herself in Antarctica. Uh, she's at a science uh, station up in Antarctica and she feels very isolated, but she feels safe. And she thinks that maybe not the best life, but she, she could be able to stay here for a little bit longer. But once again, somebody finds her and is trying to kill her. In this moment, Esther is given the choice. She can run again on her own, or she can trust someone that she's never met. And this someone has sent her a letter and sent her a plane ticket and told her to come and find them. She knows absolutely nothing about this person, but after a life of being on the run, she decides that maybe it wouldn't be so bad. Maybe this is what is going to be uh, the thing that finally saves her and makes it so she doesn't have to keep running. When she meets this person and learns more about who they are and what they have to offer, she learns that there is way more to magic than her or her sister or their father ever realized. And it's way more dangerous than any of them could have ever suspected. Uh, so this book, um, that's sort of all that I know about it, but it does sound like a really fun, adventure-filled, magic-filled book. Um, I don't know a ton more, but I think that it's going to be really exciting. I think that uh, it'll be a good way to um, to kind of enter into this author's author's works. Um, I'm really hoping that uh, as a debut work, it, it kind of checks all those boxes. Uh, so that is Ink, Blood, Sister, Scribe by Emma Torts. All right, why don't we go to Mark next? All right, thank you, Sadie. So I felt the need when I do these five, I always include at least one nonfiction book that no one else on this panel is going to read except for me. Um, so I put the, the Politics and Poetics of Everyday Life by Kristen Ross. Um, and essentially, this book is made up of a series of essays written by Ross that examine the different ways to think about everyday life across a range of discourses, practices, and knowledges. Um, essentially, how does the everyday shape our perceptions? How we do we relate to society, larger society, and ways of rethinking the everyday and the taking for granted and um, and restructuring our lives more or less. Um, in doing this, she sort of examines works of philosophy, history, the visual arts and literature, um, sort of take a look at larger collective political action and struggles around the environment. Um, in particular, she talks about environmentalism and things like that quite a lot, ecology, because as we have sort of seen in more recent decades, the ways people sort of conduct their everyday lives is very destructive to the environment. Um, so that's kind of like one of the central aspects of this book um, is this is taking a look at how essentially we can sort of rethink the everyday life in relation to the environment, in relation to things like justice, um, and how, how should I put this? Um, essentially how these sort of taken for granted things are actually much larger than what they may appear on the surface of how we conduct our day-to-day -day lives. And she sort of does this in three distinct parts. The first one's a sort of more um, standard kind of academic, kind of like review of of uh, theory and practice, like all that kind of like stuff that uh, I can tell no one's interested in right now. So I'm just gonna skip over that part. Um, the second part is essentially more about um, actual like artistic works and literature and different things like that. How different artists have represented the everyday in literature, like and things like that. Um, and the final third part is more about actual every actual struggles that have gone on in political action and social movements to reshape the everyday. Um, and she sort of gives an example of the Zod at, at Notre Dame de Landes, which was a uh, protest of hundreds of people against an airport project 
that was going to be built in a part of France that was seen as ecologically important would be very destructive. And they essentially occupied this land, making their own miniature communities with agricultural plots and different ways of social planning and organization that sort of rejected like law and order policing and things like that, and took their own way of constructing their own like miniature communities, more or less. Um, so it seems like a kind of interesting way of approaching this issue from these three different ways, uh, like the more academic, like more artistic and more practical everyday kind of political action that people have taken. So I thought that was a rather interesting combination of things that would be insightful in a number of ways. Um, Kristen Ross has also written past books on things like uh, the Paris communes of the 19th century and things like that. So she has written extensively on this kind of uh, subject matter before and found it quite interesting. So I'm going to be reading this one too. So that was The Politics and Poetics of Everyday Life by Kristen Ross. And we are going to go to Virginia. Hey, Mark, these are the selfish episode, right? Like that's what we're doing today. We are just picking books that we want to read. And do you think anyone is going to read the books that I'm going to read? No, not at all. So you do whatever makes sense for you. Um, so for my book, if you think the sharp book was weird, then you know, that's this is weirder than that. Um, so I'm gonna do another debut novel. Um, this one is coming out from Melville House in August. And I've enjoyed all the books I've read so far. And I want to just say say a shout out to all thank you to all the publishers that give us advanced copies to read ahead. I've enjoyed all of them, but this one might just be my favorite because it is so weird. Um, this is our this is uh David Connor's uh debut novel, and it's called Oh God, the Sun Goes. Now, our unnamed narrator, which is uh, Corinne's favorite thing, um, our unnamed narrator is on a quest in search of something that has gone missing. The sun has disappeared. Yes, that sun in the sky, it's gone. The world woke up one day and there's just this empty spot. And for whatever reason, our narrator is convinced that he can find the sun and that the sun is hiding in Arizona. So that's where he's starting off his search in Tempe, Arizona. And as we follow him on this journey across the state, you know, he meets all the different people and they tell them, they tell him about, you know, like what happened on the day when the son disappeared. Um, we have a mother who talk about his son who's on the swim team, but he forgot how to swim the day that the son disappeared. Um, he met a woman who lives in Bumblebee, Arizona, which is a town that has a population of 13 people. And she is deadly afraid of bees. And the, the, the town is full of bees. But she also finds them really fascinating. So she observes them through this little hole in her house and so that she can draw them. And then we have a, we met a man who has a habit of sleeping with an egg on his head. Um, it is trying to, he's trying to train himself to be disciplined so that, you know, like you, you stay focused and I, I don't know. Um, and then every day in the morning, you know, like the egg will stay intact and then he will like eat it for breakfast. But the day the sun disappeared, when he cracked open that egg, there was nothing inside. So he went to the fridge, got another egg, and then he went back to sleep and he hasn't woken up since then, even though he's still alive. Um, and many, many more things. And there's also this book called The Quantum Sun by some author and that, you know, that has allegedly a researcher who has studied a lot of things about the sun. And so you find these characters reading this book every now and then. And Sometimes, you know, when you have a setup like this, then, you know, you have a, a person who's meeting all the different people. It seems sometimes like like just a, a excuse to like, you know, showcase how weird you can get. But this is not like this. I feel like everything really, really comes together. And throughout the book, at least in the advanced copy, there's these maps throughout it and that sort of tell you where you are in the beginning of the chapter. But sooner or later, if you pay attention to the maps, you realize that, wait, wait a second, where are we exactly? So super, super interesting. Every time I feel like I figure it out, I'm like, oh, it must be this, you know? And the author will laugh in my face. It's like, no, you think you figure it out? Not at all. And everything starts off as very surreal and it stays surreal. And But it does, again, like Shark Heart, surprise you with a really emotional kind of story and heartbreaking story. So I, I love this book um, and it's just so weird and so much fun. Um, so yeah, this is uh, another debut novel coming out in August. It is called Oh God, The Sun Goes. All right, I feel really bad for Corinne because like like she was the last for every single episode, uh, every single round. Sorry, Corinne, but here you go again, Corinne. 
That's fine. I'm here to bring it back to reality. I'm here to like ground us, except for that whale book, which admittedly, arguably was more of a Mark book than a Kareen book. Um, I'm here with a Kareen book. I'm here with a book that is about the redemptive and transformative power of books. I am here for a love story that also involves a bookstore. Oh, yes. This, this, this is for me. Um, this is the story of 25-year-old, oh my gosh, my writing is so bad, Takato, I'm pretty sure. Some of my letters are harder to read than others when I'm making notes. And she has a pretty easy life. She has a good job. She has a good group of friends. And she has a boyfriend that she is pretty sure she is going to marry. Up until the point where he announces that he has been having an affair and he's going to marry that lady. Not her. This kind of, oh, this breaks her. This breaks her. Um, eventually, she loses all of her friends. She loses all of, she loses her job. <laughs> the description says she loses her acquaintance. <laughs> I'm not sure how one loses one acquaintances, but you know, you know. And she falls into a very, very deep depression that she is unable to get out of until she re- receives a phone call from her distant, uh, kind of estranged uncle, Satoru. His wife left him five years ago, and since then he has led a very unusual life. He works in the Takako Book District of Tokyo, and he runs a secondhand bookshop. And he offers her a rent-free apartment above the bookstore in return for helping him out. As she moves there, thinking that this might just be a temporary thing, as she puts the pieces of her life back together, she discovers a passion for literature and starts to build a new life with new friends and a new acquaintance with a good-looking young editor who wanders by the bookstore. However, her joy is temporary and short-lived when her ex fiance ex-boyfriend reappears and begs to be a part of her life and she also watches as her uncle's life starts to disintegrate in front of her eyes this is all about the beautiful wisdom and beauty of bookshops and how books come into our lives and change us um, this is days at the morisaki bookshop by satoshi yagisawa translated by eric ozawa um, it is coming out july 4th for, sorry, July 4th. I can't get the camera to focus on that at all. Um, and it looks to be kind of just like a beautiful, soft, gentle story, um, which sometimes you need in the heat of summer when your brain isn't working. And I am going to now throw it over to Virginia for a surprise announcement. See, that's why summer sucks, right? Like you need these special books. Summer sucks. Anyway, sorry, Mark. I <laughs> know you love summer. <laughs> well, like those were like, 20 very on brand books you know and we have five more i know i know i have saved the best for last i don't know about my book friends here but um these five books i think would be a little bit closer in theme because they're not books that we have chosen for ourselves these are books that we have chosen for one of our book friends um this is mark's last keep it fictional episode with us and so we want to dedicate these picks to you because we want to thank you for all your book recommendations in the past year Um, you know, you've jumped into this podcast so quickly, like, you know, because you're such a ferocious reader and like, you know, this was like a lot of fun for us to hear all the books that you have brought to us from all around the world. Um, you know, you're a champion of translated works, you know, you love, um, and, and you always bring to us books that like need more attention um, and they're the less obvious choices, but you know, like you're letting, making sure that the world knows about them. So thank you for that. Um, And you know, every now and then you throw in your manga pick, you throw in your science fiction pick just to like confuse us a little bit. Um, So, you know, every time you hear them like, wait, what? Like, is that a Mark book now? Like, what is this? So um, yeah. So, but thank you for the wide variety of books that you have, um, you know, you have brought to this show. And I know I have, definitely appreciate um, your picks and I know my book friends here do too um, I know you didn't get a lot of times in terms of like um, on this podcast with Sadie um, but I know you have introduced Fiona to Ocean Vong um, and also Ye Mystery which I know Fiona really really enjoy what is that again the o- octopus train what do you call it Fiona the ch- pans train I don't know something weird you have to go back to that episode to listen to it less trains into pad tunnels 
Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So like, you know, like we'll forever ever remember that. Um, you made me finally revisit of all, uh, Crow after your review of Perfect Night. You know, this book has been sitting on my bookshelf forever. So thank you for that. And of course, you brought back all of Corinne's fond memories of Italo Calvino. And Mark, I promise you, I will bring him up every other episode just for you. So, you know, thank you so much for all your picks. Um, and based on what we think is a Mark book, <laughs> uh, we have tried to find a book today that, um, you know, that you may want to suggest that you may want to pick up in the next few months. Um, so I'm going to go, uh, maybe we can start with uh, Sadie. Sadie, what have you picked for Mark? Okay, Mark. Um, so yes, as Virginia mentioned, we haven't had quite as much time um, on this podcast together uh, for me to really get a good feel for what a Mark book is. I know um, back when you first started on this podcast, all of uh, your book friends read a, a Mark pick. Um, so they kind of have firsthand knowledge um, into what a Mark book is. Um, and I wasn't able to do that, but I did go back and I listened to your first episode on the podcast to kind of get a sense of what a true Mark book is. And so the things that kind of stood out for me and what I have noticed in the books that you have talked about since I've been back on the podcast, um, one translated and two philosophical. So those were the two words that kind of drew me in for what a Mark pick could be. Um, so I am cheating just a tiny little bit with this one because this one doesn't actually come out until October. Uh, so the, this does sound like something that you would like to read. You might have to wait just a little bit longer. Um, so this particular book is not translated, but past books of this author's have been translated. Um, and I think that this the author just might be writing um, in English um, for this one himself. So this is The Maniac by Benjamin Labatet. And um, The Maniac takes place um, kind of over... Of, uh, I think about a hundred years and it follows the story of John von Neumann. Now I am not super familiar with who John von Neumann is, um, but it says that he transformed every field that he touched. He invented game theory. I don't know a lot about game theory, but he invented game theory and the first programmable computer and pioneering AI, digital life and cellular automata. I'm not sure if this is true or not. But anyways, he is kind of where this story takes place. Um, follows uh, John von Neumann. And it's at the center of a literary triptych that begins with Paul Ehrenfest. And Paul Ehrenfest is an Austrian physicist and friend of Einstein who fell into deep despair when he saw science and technology become tyrannical forces. And our story ends 100 years later in a showdown between the South Korean Go master Lee Sedell and an AI program, Alpha Go. Yes, I'm, I'm not sure what Kareen's looks are, are exactly for, but I'm going to I'm just going to power through. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going. <laughs> um, and it embodies the central question of von Neumann's most ambitious unfinished project, which is the creation of self-reproducing machines and intelligence able to evolve beyond human understanding or control. Now, Mark, I don't know if you know or like a lot about AI things or technology, but what kind of pulled me in for this one is it says it uh, blends fact, fiction, and confronts us with the deepest questions we face as a species which I feel like that in and of itself does kind of speak to you, Mark, and speak to the kind of books that you like to read. You like the ones that kind of make you think, I I, I think this is what I've gathered, <laughs> make you think, make you see different perspectives, kind of answer and ask those questions um, that we're kind of already thinking about on a, on a much larger scale. So if that maybe sounds like something you'd be interested in, you could pick up in October, The Maniac by Benjamin Levitt. I think even the cover is a very Mark book. I think that's definitely a Mark book. Good job, Sadie. <laughs> Mark, what do you think? I think you did a very good job with that one. Um, I actually, I hadn't heard of Jonathan, John Van Newman, but I just, just looked him up and he is a real person. And I know the events with AlphaGo, that's definitely real as well. So it definitely does have like a long-term kind of arc of like his life and then what came afterwards this is why I kind of get the impression from that and I have heard of La Boutette before I haven't read him but he definitely does seem like an interesting writer I, 
All right. Fiona, what is your mark book? <laughs> so I 100% phoned this in. <laughs> and um, um, I apologize because I have gotten so many good uh, recommendations from Mark. As as Virginia mentioned, um, on Life We're Breathing Gorgeous, uh, I read uh, because of Mark. And that is now on my top 10 favorite of all time. Um, also really enjoyed The Envoy. Um, but my favorite is probably when Mark talks about the like, like, like slice of life Japanese, like about young Japanese people I I just like to like sit and listen to that and I feel like that could be like my pot well you know thankfully I do have a podcast where I can go back and just listen to that when I need to calm down <laughs> but I did phone it in today because basically what I did uh this was my strategy was I googled um Japanese translations coming out in North America uh in the next couple of months and then I pretty much just uh browsed through until I found one that I found interesting so, um, as we all know from Mark, uh, a translated edition coming out in North America is fair game. Absolutely. Uh, so I have chosen a um, a release, a North American release, re-release <laughs> of a Japanese classic uh, novella called uh, The Kappa. And this is by... Uh, Ryun, Ryunosuke Ag Agutagawa, um, and I don't, and I apologize because um, I don't have a lot of context for, for Japanese literature, so I don't know if that rings bells for people generally or if that rings bells for Mark, um, but uh, this was actually his last, um, his last piece of writing, um, and it is about a uh, person in a psychiatric facility who is telling the story of his trip to Kappa land. So if you don't know, Kappa are these um, these creatures of folklore uh, who steal children and drag them down and drown them, essentially. Um, but this ex his experience with Kappas is quite different. He uh, goes to this Kappa world um, and is welcomed by the Kappas. Uh, and he makes all of these observations about their society and they sort of like treat him like a novelty, um, uh, a guest, and they show him all around. Uh, and it has been likened to um, like Alice in Wonderland and uh, Gulliver's Travels. Um, and the book is about him um, telling this story in a psychiatric ward. <laughs> Um, so it is suggested that, you know, it is um, satire, uh, a, a reflection on Japanese society. Um, and to me, that really said, Mark, of like a, a relation to the literary canon, um, a reflection on society. Um, yeah, maybe like less positive than the ones that I really love to hear Mark talk about, um, but very much this like expression of... Um, of and critique of society uh with an additional like aspect of sort of like mental health and uh and and mental illness so um again this is not the first time it's been released in um in north america but this is uh from new directions and it is translated by lisa hoffman kuroda and allison markin Powell um and you know at the very least it's a novella so uh if you decided to pick it up it won't take you that long to read <laughs> yeah um I I I thought it sounded very interesting and and especially after hearing all of the Japanese fiction that Mark talks about um kind of want to gain more context uh for yeah understanding that sort of like uh literary history uh, of of Japanese literature. So thank you, Mark. There's definitely one by Octago that I haven't read before that um, is definitely been meaning to read it. And based on my enjoyment of his short stories, um, he's definitely one of the most famous Japanese writers of the early 20th century. So it's an opportunity to read that finally would be definitely on my TBR. All right. Okay. Because Mark's brand of Japanese translated literature is so strong that I feel like some of us may have also thought about that right away. Maybe. Um, so <laughs> also, when we kind of a more obvious choice, maybe. Um, and it's another offer um, that, you know, 
this is their first work to be translated into English. They've read, they have read, uh, they have written like 17 books in Japan. Many of them are award winners, but they haven't been translated. So this is the first one. And I know, Mark, you're always looking for like uh, newer offers that uh, to read in English, uh, in, to be translated. So yeah, so I think this, this will work. I know, Mark, you also can handle uh, strange and weird and surreal stuff. Um, so this one definitely has that. And as Sadie pointed out, you are kind of a big idea person. You know, your literature often get philosophical. So I think this one definitely has a lot of things to think about, commentary on society and all of that. And previously on our podcast, you have chosen the topic for us to do a topic on writers um, and writing. And so this book is about writers. So I feel like I've checked some boxes, even if it is very obvious. Um, and so this is uh, a uh, book from Counterpoint, and this is coming out in July, and it is called The Forest Brims Over, and it is by Maru Ayase and translated by Hayden Trowell. And look at those owls on the cover. But do there are there owls in the book? No, there aren't. But it's okay because this is a book for Mark, not for me. Um. So anyway, this is a story, first of all, told from the point of view of Setaguchi. Uh, and we'll hear from different characters as the story goes along. And Setaguchi is a fiction editor at a publishing house. Um, and he works with many, many different authors. And one of them is Noah Tari. Noah Talley has gained some popularity after his book, The Tears, came out. And The Tears is supposed to be based on his wife, Rui. And he has sort of depicted his wife as this ideal woman. And it's a very, like, book that has a lot of really frank descriptions of her. Um, and, and it's somehow connected to the readers. And, and you know, he's getting popular. And now Sadaguchi and him is working on sort of well, what's next? What should we do next? Now, Noatali, like many authors, have many different quirks. So sometimes he goes into these deep thinking modes. And then you know that you don't disturb him when he's thinking. Sometimes it takes a few minutes, sometimes hours. So while Sadaguchi is waiting for him to get out of his trance, um, he thought he would just kind of like look around and observe Rui, the wife, secretly. Because Rui, like everybody's fascinated with her, right? Because she's like the woman that is supposed to be his inspiration. Rui has sat down after dropping off some snacks and the coffee that she made. And now she's eating from a bowl. A bowl that looks like it's full of seeds and nuts, maybe? I don't can't quite see. And she seems oblivious to Setaguchi watching her. And so she just keeps eating and eating and eating. Seed after seed. And... Then suddenly the Watali is like, oh, okay, well, you know what? I think I've got some ideas, you know, like, uh, you know, I'll call you next time and then we'll come meet again. Let me just like, you know, form, um, let me just like, you know, form a draft or something like that. Then the next time they meet, Noatali says, you know what? I've actually changed my mind. You know, the ideas that I told you about, yeah, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to write my next book on my wife. And Sadaguchi is like, again, you already did that. But then Rui shows up and Sadaguchi can see why. This might be a little bit different because Rui now has leaves and roots and green stuff coming out is sprouting all over her body, possibly from all the seeds that she has been eating last time. Um, and Sadaguchi is, of course, really disturbed by this. And he's like, oh, like, what did the doctor say? Is, is, is Rui okay? And the Watali is like, oh, we didn't go to the doctor. It's okay. Rui is okay with it. Let's talk about the book. I'm going to write about this. And, oh, by the way, um, and then so then, you know, so they, they talk a little bit. And Sadaguchi is like, oh, this is, this is messed up. What is going on? Then he got a phone call again the next time. And he said, oh, yeah, you know, like, I have more ideas. Come, come to my house. You know, let's talk about it. But before you go on your way here, can you pick up a giant tank and pick up some soil and all that? And... Sadaguchi did that, and when he got to the house, he can see there's leaves, there's vines, there's stems, there's trees, there's everything coming down from the second floor. And it looks like Rui has grown and has turned into a forest. This is one of those fable, of course, that talks about, you know, like looking at traditional values, looking at how women are being treated. Um, and you know, and in a in a patriarchy kind of society, and how they're exploited um, in in this book, um, and I it, it I think Mark, you will quite enjoy it because it is so weird. It is so weird. 
um, you know, but like it's also really, really fascinating because then later on you move into the different other point of view. You meet a woman that uh, goes to uh, Noah Tali's creative writing class. Then you hear a little bit from Rui herself and then you meet another editor and then finally you hear from Noah Tali. And it's just this nice evolution um, and, and it's just it's, it's so weird. I, I, I hope you enjoy it. So, um, you know, yeah, I know it's a it's an obvious pick, but, you know, hopefully you will you will like it. This is The Forest Brims Over by Maru Ayi. Yase, translated by Hayden Trowell. Yeah. Yes. I actually have not heard of that one particularly before, but it definitely has a unique take on it. And it also reminds me of once, there's one book by Kobo Abe, another Japanese writer about a man who has daikon rash is starting to sprout from his shins in one of his books that I have not read, but it definitely calls that to mind. Um, so perhaps there's a bit of connection there between the two. Um, Definitely worth checking out, I think. What was the real estate on that one again? July. 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 Let's yeah. keep an eye on that one then. All right, Corrine. Yeah. Okay. So with our book friends, we usually talk a lot about Venn diagrams. So where one person kind of has a wheelhouse, Sadie's is like supernatural, strong female protagonist fighting, fighting bad against like Victorian people with canes. Um, some people have some very specific circles of interest that they have. Um, Virginia's obviously being weird fiction. Um, Fiona has a thing about nuns. Like everyone's kind of got their own Venn, Venn diagrams. And every once in a while, like some people have a very strong overlap. So Sadie and I both like mystery fiction. We both like Victorian fiction. Um, Fiona and I both enjoy a romance book every once in a while if it's really well written and people actually talk to each other instead of just like avoiding a conversation that they should have that would clear this up in about 15 seconds um virginia and i no um and mark and i <laughs> i tend to think of your the books that you choose as very to choose an internet parlance for a very big brained very big brained there's a lot going on with them um, so for the episode where we read one of your picks, I read a Murakami book and was confused and furious, um, both of those emotions at the same time. Um, but I understand why you like it, I think. Um, so yeah, I, again, people say that your books are very philosophical. I think that you like to grapple with big questions. I think you like to grapple with big topics and you aren't afraid to really think deeply about one thing which I really admire um but in terms of our Venn diagrams it's rough to, but but not impossible to find a book where both of us agree on something I think that sometimes I have been so pleasantly surprised by some of your outliers um like your love of science fiction um again your love of manga is something that I think we both have in common um and appreciation for just a good story well told. Um, so in choosing a book for you, I try to find one where I think our Venn diagrams would intersect. Um, it is another Japanese work in translation because you've got a strong brand. You've got a brand. And so I thought this was an interesting book that is probably grappling with some big things and you would probably read a lot more into it than I would and that's okay to every book their reader um this is the book by Riku Onda translated by Philip Gabriel which is Honeybees and Distant Thunder um it's coming out on May 2nd and it is about a piano competition uh as people know I feel very very passionately about music. And I often ask Mark a lot of questions about his music, trying to suss out exactly what his genre and style are. So I thought that this would be kind of like a fun through line to choose. Um, it is about kind of a prestigious piano competition. Um, and the people who are trying to compete, all of them for their various different reasons. And this piano competition is kind of like the apex of their joy and of their greatest despair. And so we have a bunch of different people competing, kind of our four main characters, um, which I think you would also like because you get different points of view and different stories. Um, one of them is Aya, who is a child prodigy who, after um, the death of their mother, is attempting to kind of stage a comeback. 
So they are there to kind of redeem themselves. Um, Masaru uh, was a childhood friend of Aya and is finally reunited with them and wants them both to win, to kind of support each other, but realizes that in a competition, only one of them is really going to get the prize. There's also Akashi, who is older. Um, he is married. He works in a store. He's kind of living his humdrum life. And this piano competition is his last chance at glory and prestige. And then there is also Jin, who's a 16-year-old prodigy, who is kind of like a free spirit in the world, who is untrained and yet is unable to play mesmerizing songs on the piano. So all four of these competitors are kind of pushing themselves to the brink in pursuit of beauty, in pursuit of glory, and in pursuit of perfection. And this book is asking what, but at what cost? What do we have to give up of ourselves, of our relationships, of our life in, to pursue that beauty, to pursue that perfection? And so I think that that's a big question as an appreciator of art, of the visual arts, um, especially I know you're into photography, you're into kind of fine art things. Um, I think that this could be an interesting read for you and kind of learning about the lives and pursuits and struggles of, of musical artists. So it might not be exactly what you are more interested in, but I think you'll definitely appreciate it because I think you have big brain thoughts about art. Um, so even though it might be a little bit more, oh, how shall we say this, grounded in the real world, um, things are going to happen in a progressive way. People are going to be people and not turn into weird things there's going to be no plague there's probably not going to be an apocalypse they're not going to be in space and meet each other um yeah i think you could enjoy this and i hope you do um so that is honeybees and distant thunder thank you Karine. i think there definitely is a lot of overlap in those maybe not like the most obvious theme of the book but definitely in like the, the different aspects of the book they all kind of line up i feel like so yeah, I haven't heard of that one before, but I definitely will be checking it out as well, I think. Yeah. So. All right. Well, I think I, I hope they work out. I hope the four the recommendations work out, but I'm pretty sure the next one is gonna work out because you picked that for yourself. So <laughs> <laughs> that should be a mark book, right, Mark? <laughs> All right, give us your last big mark. This is kind of funny how this works out because this is a Japanese translated work. That, of course, happened to be the last one. I didn't, just happened to be the last one I had on the list. Didn't have it planned out that way or anything like that. But I chose Mild Vertigo by Miyako Kenai. Um, so in Mild Vertigo, we follow the life of a seemingly kind of average and mundane housewife, Natsumi, who lives in suburban Japan with her husband and two sons. Um, but as she goes about her daily life, she sort of gradually becomes kind of dissatisfied. She feels like she's just performing these kind of rote, mundane chores and tasks. And they suddenly start to take on like a more surreal and otherworldly tone and twist that she begins to question how she's been leading her life and sort of basically just playing the role of the dutiful housewife to her husband, her children, how she's started to kind of fall, in, fall into a bit of a rut in a way that... Um, uh, as she's falling into this rut, she no longer feel, feels like she's enjoying these sort of things. She's just kind of like on autopilot almost, you could say. Um, and she starts, starts to feel this disconnect and discomfort with her everyday life, um, her day-to-day -day routines, and the responsibilities that have sort of been forced upon her in this role as wife, mother, um, housewife, however you want to put it. And sort of based on the many of the early reviews and blurbs that I've read about the book, um, it sort of indicates that Natsumi often reflects on the kind of inherent strangeness of things, people, and social conventions, and other ideas that once you sort of take away their assumed naturalness, um, it sort of becomes disorienting, sort of as the title suggests, like a feeling of mild vertigo that you're just kind of like not quite comfortable or something. There's something that's not quite right about the way you're feeling in these situations all of a sudden. Um, it kind of reveals the hidden constraints and assumptions that are sort of built in these everyday things. Um, the descriptions of the book that I've also seen, I've compared Kanai's writing to another Japanese writer that I coincidentally just mentioned, Kobo Abe, because as Abe has written about many like detectives who like are looking out 
trying to f- track down someone down, but then all of a sudden they themselves start to feel lost in these kinds of feelings of like, like disconnect and dread and like, um, just not, just not feeling in place anymore, more or less that kind of existential feeling of being out of place. Um, which I think, um, I can definitely see a kind of parallel based on the descriptions I've read of this book. Um, so that's definitely another connection that makes me want to read it. Um, another funny thing is that even though Kanai has been writing since the 1970s and has a cult following in Japan, the very little of our writing has been released in English. And this one's being released by New Directions Publishers. So it's definitely extra motivation to pick up the work, I think, because she's written many novels, essays, poems, and has also done film and literary criticism. So she's definitely got like a very wide and variety, wide variety of work and output that hopefully one day will be available in English. And I think this will be a good place to start with her work. Surreal. Surreal is definitely one of your circles. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I need to put mm-hmm. um, uh, Kobo Abe on my list. I've been trying to look for the kangaroo notebook, but nobody has it. It's out of print and there's no ILL yep. either, which drives me nuts. So I can't, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know where to find it. So unfortunately, a lot of his works that like some of, like he also wrote plays that are very hard to find as well. Um, some of his earlier novels are also quite difficult to find. Um, so he's definitely one of those writers. If you ever see like a used bookstore, he's definitely one of those names to look for. At the, it's usually at the very start of the the fiction section, starting with A B. That's going to put you right at the start there. Unless there's an aardvark author, he's probably going to be the first. Yeah, so I have to go and keep an eye on those. So yeah, I've been trying to read that. Um, anyway, so you know, like, thank you, Mark, for uh being with us. You know, um, and and doing this podcast. You know, it's like I said, it's been really so much more fun with all the different picks that you have given us, and just from around the world. So that's you know, like it's been a great ride for all of us. So thank you for that. Um, yeah. And uh, I hope you will pick up one of these books, you know, so many of them, <laughs> so many of them. Um, yeah. And, and, and we will, we'll have more, we'll have more recommendations, you know, in uh, next week. So thank you again. And I will, uh, we'll see all of you next week. Bye. Bye.